Okay. We've got the video going. Can, can you see okay? I got a thumbs up. Can you hear okay? Can you smell and taste okay? Yeah, I know, I know it sucks. Okay. Ah. For some reason, I'm very anxious about giving this uh, lecture today. It's sort of a different perspective than we've taken in the past because I'm actually going to go back to the historical development of, uh, of certain essential ingredients. Um, and maybe it's just following the logic of mathematics is simpler. But, um, but this is a place where I think it's actually worthwhile to go back to the historical development. Um, but it's also, I, I don't know, I mean, there's just... Yeah, maybe that's why I'm nervous. It's just that it's historical versus mathematical. But anyway, all right, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna, well, actually, I'm not 100% sure what we're gonna do because we've got now three more lectures um, and we lost two because we lost a week of class. And of course, last Thursday, I did not wanna give you a lecture. I wanted to have some fun. I technically have four lectures worth of material to cover, but I only have three lectures uh, to do it in. And I don't know if I'm going to try and, I don't know what I'm going to do, but anyway, I'll figure that out and I'll get back to you. <laughs> but for today, I think I'm going to be introducing the weak interactions and our calculations in the weak interactions, um, and then we'll finish it up next time, and then we'll just spend the last lecture talking about renormalization, although renormalization itself is easily a two-lecture topic, so I'll have to figure it out. But, um, all right, so... Uh, what we're going to talk about uh, is the weak interactions, um, and you might want to mute your, here I'll just do it for you, because I can mute you, I have that much power, it's amazing. Anyway, um, uh, so uh, yeah, so the weak, the weak interactions, and this is the topic that I like to call, uh, these are such awesomely new markers, they're impossible to open. Um, this is the topic that I like to call a weak sauce. And today we're going to talk about the ugly side. Because it turns out that, um, you know, you thought QED was really pretty and nice and simple and then QCD was more complicated. The weak interactions is really where it gets just, just fugly is, I think, the right word. Um, but anyway, so um, now the so we have to wonder for a moment. You know, we we talked about this for the strong interactions for QCD, but you know, why is it that E and M is so much more accessible to us at sort of room temperature energies um, than the strong interactions or the weak interactions? Um, and I'll let, let me just pick a card, um, Avery. Avery, why don't you tell us why the strong interactions are so hard to access, um, to access at, you know, sort of room temperatures, or room temperature energies? Uh, no, they're valid at low energy as well. No. They're valid at all energies. I don't know the answer to this one. Can anybody help them? Can I call on someone? Yes, you can. All right. Uh, it looks like Ross just turned on his camera for the occasion, so... Uh, and he fixed his hair. He fixed his hair. That's <laughs> important, too. Yeah, of course, because you have to have perfect hair to do physics. Um, uh, <laughs> is that uh, QCD is strongly coupled at low energies, and so it's highly nonlinear. That means it's very difficult to solve uh, for any of the dynamics. Well, there's, a, there's also another reason, um, and that's because that's because, it, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that we know so much about electricity and magnetism is that we're not confined to electrically neutral atoms, right? We can actually take an electron and pull it off of an atom, and so now we have 
a charged electron and a charged, you know, nucleus, and we can move them, you know, very far apart and measure the forces between them, and we can build up a bunch of electrons on a sheet, you know, and a capacitor, and we can, so you can create these sort of macroscopic, you know, distributions of charges. Can we do that with color? Can we just, yeah, no, right, exactly. Yeah, remember in the, in the strong interactions, everything is bound to live in these colorless uh, singlet configurations and it's impossible to actually extricate, you know, the color charge and separate it and then do an experiment like that. So that's the reason that the strong interactions, I mean, also the nonlinearities that um, Ross pointed out are also con contribute to it. But the fact that everything has to live in these colorless combinations is the essential ingredient for why it's, it's kind of like, how would you discover electric charge if it was absolutely impossible to remove an electron from an, a, a, from, from an atom? You know, you could, you could beat on it and get kind of get Van der Waals type forces, but it's, and you'd eventually understand it, but it's easier to just pop an electron off and say, well, I've got an electrically charged electron and let's see what, what it does, what we can do with it. So, um, so then the question is, is, you know, what makes the weak interactions you know, so, so challenging. And we're gonna learn why that's the case, but essentially, you know, the, the underlying idea is that the weak interactions appear to be much weaker, and the impact of the weak interactions is hard to discern. And um, one of the reasons why it's, why it's hard to discern is as follows. First of all, if we write down the couplings, I'm um, sorry then we find that the strong interaction has the largest coupling at a given energy scale. If you change the energy scale, all of these couplings uh, vary, and we'll talk about that when we talk about renormalization. But the strong interactions have the largest coupling, the weak interactions have the second largest, and the electromagnetic interaction has the weakest. And so that might make you wonder, oh, wait, wait a second, the, the weak interactions have a more pronounced effect. They play a stronger role in, in Feynman diagrams and so forth. But there is an essential feature of the weak interactions that we can't forget. And by the way, when I talk about the weak interactions, I'm talking about the weak interactions at room temperature, which means I'm talking about the spontaneously broken form of the weak interactions. If you take the weak interactions to high enough energies, then eventually you restore the SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge symmetry. That difference between being in the symmetric state versus the broken symmetry state, which is at room temperature, contributes to a, 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 a part of the weak interactions, which I've hinted at before, causes them to be effectively much weaker. And Gabriel, what is it that happens in the weak interaction theory when the, break, when the symmetry breaks that you might guess causes the weak interactions to play a less critical role? The force-carrying particles gain mass. Exactly, the force-carrying particles gain mass. And so you remember whenever you have a propagator on an internal leg of a diagram, you have something in the numerator over Q squared minus M squared C squared, okay? This is if the particle has mass. If the particle has no mass, then it's just, what, it's something over Q squared. The something depends on the particulars of the theory. But the basic point is, is that you go from a photon in electromagnetism, which has no mass, so you just divide by Q squared, to the, M plus, the W plus minus charged weak bosons and the Z naught boson have huge masses, and they're coming in the denominator. So when these internal propagators exist in a Feynman diagram, they're highly suppressed compared to the contributions when there's no mass term, okay? So that's essentially why the weak interactions are gonna play a comparatively small role, but nonetheless, it's an incredibly important role. It's an incredibly important role because if we're interested in the true decay of a particle, it has to happen via the weak interactions, okay? And we'll draw plenty of diagrams which will, which will illustrate that, but, but basically, you know, Q, QED and QCD 
are flavor conserving. You know, if you have a QED diagram and you have an electron come in, you have an electron go out. The electron doesn't change in anything else. If you have a QCD diagram and you have an up quark come in and it emits a gluon, then you have an up quark go out. It doesn't change in anything else. The weak interactions have this wonderful property, though, that you can have uh, an electron come in and through the emission of a W, maybe it's a W minus, then you can have an electron neutrino leave. So this you can imagine as part of a diagram where an electron disappears. I mean, you know, this isn't a complete diagram because this thing can't exist in infinitely, but you can build up the rest of a diagram where an electron enters and no electron exits. Here though, if you have, a, if you have an up quark enter, you have to have the up quark persist, and here the electron persists. So the weak interactions are the essential ingredient in the true decay of anything, okay? Now don't get me wrong, I mean, you can have strong interaction mediated decay if you, for example, have a, a meson, you know, which is an up quark and, an, and maybe an anti-up quark. So this meson can decay because the up quark and the anti-up quark can annihilate each other, you know, through all kinds of interesting mechanisms. But I'm just talking about the decay of fundamental particles. Okay? The decay of fundamental particles can only take place through the weak interactions. All right, so, um, okay, so here we go. Um, we're going to start with a little story called CKM, and I like to call this the power of theory. And again, this is a bit of a history lesson, but um, one of the themes here is that uh, there's predictions of things well before they are actually uh, experimentally verified. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why the predictions were inspired, what they are exactly, and then I'll throw out some dates as to the difference between the theorization of things and the actual experimental verification. So first of all, um, remember the basic, and that is that the W plus and minus change lepton flavor via the following mechanism. First of all, we organize the leptons in these, into these doublets. Okay? Where there's a couple of interesting things about the reason I've organized these doublets as, as, as given. First of all, what is the electric charge of the upper particle throughout the doublet? Sarah. So these are neutrinos. What are their electric charge? You don't know the electric charge of a neutrino? Oh. Starts with the term neut. 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 Yeah, it's zero. They're neutral. So these have an electric charge of zero. And then the bottom elements all have the same fundamental electric charge. So they have the electric charge E, which is the charge of the electron. The muon has the same charge as the electron. The tau one has the same charge as the electron. So we'll just call it E. Okay? Now, additionally, if you go down each of the doublets, you're increasing mass. Because neutrinos have, they have very, very tiny mass. I mean, in the, in, the, in the most simple way of dealing with them, you just say they're massless. And that's largely how we'll deal with neutrinos in this class. But more recently, there's been scientific evidence that they have some very, very tiny but non-zero mass. But at any rate, the mass at the bottom part of each of these doublets is way bigger than the mass of the neutrino. So if you go down in each doublet, you're going larger in mass. And then if you go across the doublets, 
then you're increasing the mass. Okay, so the mass of the muon is bigger than the electron, the mass of the tau one is bigger than the muon, and it might or might not be that case for the neutrinos, but it probably does, you know, experience an increase in mass as you go across the neutrinos by doublets, okay? And then, of course, you have this basic diagram that I drew earlier. And remember, weak interactions, you draw the, the, or sorry, yeah, for the weak interactions, the propagator is always the jagged line. It's not the swirly line of the photon. And I could enhance my jaggedness at least once. Just so that you never wonder if that's a photon line or not. Okay? And then, in, in gauging whether I put W plus or minus there, you just have to conserve electric charge at the vertex. So here we have a negative electric charge coming into the vertex. We have zero electric charge leaving the vertex. If I want to imagine that as happening because of the emission of a particle, would I use a W plus or minus here? Eric, Jan? Eric is I'm here. oh you are good if i'm imagining the electron turning into the neutrino would i emit a w plus or a w minus would you emit a w minus yeah yeah because the w minus has a negative electric charge so it's just carrying away the charge that this loses in becoming neutral however of course i could reverse the direction and so I can instead think about the electron absorbing something. And if it's absorbing something, Eric, since you've already got the first one, if it's absorbing something, would it absorb a W plus or a W minus? Eric? It would absorb the W plus? Yeah, yeah. But if you think about it, remember when I said if you reverse the arrow that's on a propagator, that's basically changing the particle for the antiparticle. Remember that? Well, what's the, what's the antipartner of a W plus? W minus. It's a W minus. So you, you see how all the parts of the story are consistent? And you're largely just assigning whether it's a W plus being absorbed or a W minus being emitted. You know, either one works, and it's, you know, which one you should pick or, or which direction you should pick for the W plus depends on co charge conservation at the vertex. Okay, so now for the weak interactions with the W plus and minus dealing with leptons, this is straightforward, okay? It's, it's really not that bad. It's about to get bad though because we're going to look at quarks. For quarks, things suck. Okay? So here comes your quark story. Your quark story kind of sucks. So first of all, let me do uh, some organization of the quarks like so. So first of all, I can organize the quarks in the following set of doublets. So up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. And, you know, clearly this is up and this is down because this is on the top and this is on the bottom. But that's also why this is top and this is bottom. Why this is charmed and why this is strange, I have no idea. Okay? I'm just saying. But the, the <laughs> organ... Truth and beauty. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, it gets confusing. So, um... So the UCTs all have charges of proportional to the electric charge with a factor of two-thirds, okay? And all of the bottom elements have a charge proportional to the electric charge with a factor of minus one-third, okay? So that's similar to the organization that we have up here. Now, you know, bear in mind there are anti-partners anti to all of these, so you can also get 
U bar, C bar, T bar with charge minus two thirds, and then V bar, S bar, V bar with charge plus one third. So you kind of get a spectrum of electric charges. But if you want to talk about increasing mass, it actually shifts a bit. Okay. It shifts a bit because this is the pairings, or the, I mean, it's the same pairings, but you're in, in these two cases, you're flipping the bottom and the top elements. But if you want to go through and talk about increasing mass, then you have to write them like this. And in this case, it's actually, as you go one at a time, the mass gets bigger. So the up cork has the smallest mass, the down cork has the next smallest, then the strange, and then the charm, and then the bottom, and then the top. It's not quite like this because, you know, the, the electron has much larger mass than the muon neutrino. But here, the down quark has a much smaller mass than the strange quark. The strange quark has smaller mass than the charm quark. The charm quark has smaller mass than the bottom quark. And the bottom quark has smaller mass than the top quark. Okay? Now... When you're organizing diagrams and you're conserving electric charge at, 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 at interaction vertices and so forth, this is clearly the organization that you're going to want. So why is this organization important at all? Why do you think knowing the increasing masses of, of quarks is relevant at all? I'll just ask somebody. Daniel, are you on? Daniel, you're on. Daniel. Yes. Why well, is the mass important? It's so funny. There are two Daniels, and I just call Daniel and hope one of you answers, but thanks for answering. Um, what is so important about knowing the order of the masses of quarks? Well, remember, there's a historical element to what I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to kind of tell you about, you know, the discovery, the prediction of the existence of things, and then the discovery, the experimental discovery of them. So what about this mass, you know, increasing mass scale, do you think, is relevant for the historical development? easier to find larger or massive? That's exactly backwards. It's much easier to find the less massive things because if you want to create, you know, if you want to create something that has a mass mu, you have to smash stuff together with a total energy which is at least mu. Okay. So now if you want to make something which, you know, has a mass m top, you have to smash things together with a total energy which is at least m top. Well, the history of experiment is that, you know, early experiments used less energy. They, you know, couldn't figure out how to make high energy experiments. And then they've basically grown to larger and larger energy scales, which meant that they've been able to create more and more massive particles. So if we track the uh, discovery of these things, you know, the up and the down, the strange, and then the charmed, and then the bottom and then the top. Okay. That's the order in which these things were actually experimentally verifiable. Okay, so, what is so ugly about it? Well, um, in, in 1963, uh, we had three quarks that had been discovered. Okay? So, you know, there was, and, and I don't even want to talk about what I meant by discovered, because, right, they couldn't do an experiment and find an up quark, because you can't have an isolated up quark. So there's a, a huge amount of, of complications that go into what experiments they did, how they interpreted the data, but uh, at any rate, by 1963, they were confident that there existed three quarks. 
Now bear in mind, this is before the appreciation of these different generations. This is generation one, generation two, generation three, okay? So all they had was up, down, and strange, and they didn't even really have the, you know, this formed a doublet pair, and this formed half of a doublet pair. That part of the story wasn't really there, okay? Now, um, okay, so um, from experiments, Now bear in mind, um, if, if we took these three and we kind of imagined that they were part of a set of doublets, and this and this and this just hadn't been discovered yet, um, then you might imagine that uh, the primary diagram that you'd use a W plus or minus for would be a diagram where an up quark comes in, a down quark goes out, and then you have a minus charged up quark going to a positively charged down quark. So would this correspond to the emission or the absorption of a W plus or minus? Joel, is Joel being on? I don't see him. Joel is very busy and is not going to be showing up to class anymore. Okay, Nico. Is Nico on? Yeah, there you are. Sorry, sorry. Um, if I'm going from an up quark to a down quark, and I want to consider the emission of a W boson, is that a W plus or a W minus boson? Um, up, oh, sorry. Here. Sorry, hold on. Down to up. You're going down to up, so you're going from negative to positive, so you're emitting a W negative. Yes, good. Okay, I just want to kind of take you through the charge conservation story at each vertex a few times, and then we'll just draw a W, and then you can pick which, if it's the anti-W or the, the regular W. Okay, now, um, this makes sense. This is very similar to what's happening with the leptons, where we connect the electron to the electron neutrino. Okay. But a guy named Kabibo realized that this contribution to the diagrams and the quantities that he calculated and compared to the experimental results, this diagram was not giving him the right answers, okay? And so what he proposed was the following. What he proposed was that in addition to this diagram, there also existed this diagram. Okay. Now, what's key about this diagram that we know now, that they didn't really understand then, but we understand it now, is that this diagram is allowing me to take something in one family, this one, and transition it into something in another family, this one. Okay. Remember, that doesn't happen with leptons. With leptons, you always stay within the family. Or sorry, within the generation. Damn, these words get confusing. It, with, with leptons, you always, the W plus and minus just transitions you between the two states in a given generation. Here though, he introduced an interaction which was transferring me from this generation to this generation, okay? Moreover, he had a value, a relative value for this diagram versus this diagram and of course, this is a weak interaction vertex, so I'm just going to write a vertex operator here, and we'll call this the W minus vertex. And I actually have the expression for this in the notes, but I don't want to start writing it right now because it's complicated, and we're going to talk about that more next time. Okay? But it turns out that the vertex operator that you put in here is exactly the same. Okay? except there's a factor which differentiates these. This has a factor of cosine theta c, and this has a factor of sine theta c, where theta c, which is of course 
the Kibibo angle is 13.5 degrees. Okay? So if you think about it, if everything is roughly the same between these two diagrams, and it's not because you know the down quark and the strange quark have different masses, so the mass that goes in the propagators for these two are a little bit different, okay? But then, you know, it's the same propagator here, it's the same propagator here, it's the same propagator here, same propagator here, but the other difference is the vertex factors, because the vertex factor here uses an element which is the same as the element here, but it uses a factor of cosine theta, and since your theta is 13.5, this is getting a much larger contribution than the one accompanying with uh, sine theta c. Okay? But nonetheless, Kabibo introducing this and allowing the weak interactions to move you from one generation to the other gave him results which were experimentally verified. So this is the first headache of the weak interactions is they're not going to stay within a generation. Okay, now this is only true for quarks. It's not true for leptons, it's true for quarks. But that's kind of a pain. But here's where it gets interesting. There's a problem in the experimental data that this doesn't address. And that problem comes from the following process. Um, so there's a particle called a K0. Okay, it's a neutral kaon. And a K0 particle is composed of an anti-strange and a down quark, okay? So these together give us the K0 particle. And when you want to consider the decay of a K0 particle into, for example, a mu plus and a mu minus, then the lowest order diagram that contributes to this is the following. Now, let's look at this for a second. Clearly, this diagram has got an interaction vertex which involves a down quark being translated into an up quark. And then it also has an interaction vertex where the up quark is transitioned into a strange quark. And then on the outgoing, you're dealing with leptons and you'll notice all the interaction vertices keep you within the same generation. This just turns a muon into a muon neutrino and then back into a muon, okay? So we're following these rules. This is the lowest order diagram that does it, and of course you're exchanging Ws, and whether it's W plus or minus depends on whether you want the arrow to go right or left, okay? Now, M, is going to depend on, let me see, is Hunter Leon on? No, goodness, Ian, are you on Ian? Yes, Ian's on, good, sweet, Ian. How is the Kabibo angle going to present itself in this amplitude M? Uh, would that just be by multiplying by a factor of the sine or cosine of the angle? This multiplying by the sine or the cosine? Uh, I suppose, I guess, depending on... Uh, hmm, that's a good question. Well, look, you've got a vertex which takes a D into a U, and you've got a vertex which takes a U into an S. So what do you think the theta C dependence is going to be? Um, is that the cosine? Just this one? Well, this one's on the diagram too, isn't it? Oh, I see. So is it, is it both sine times sine? Yeah, exactly. This thing is going to depend on sine theta c times cosine theta c. Plus a bunch of other junk, but these are the only places where the 
theta factors are going to enter into the story, and they're just going to be multiplied together because when you're writing down an expression for m, you just multiply vertex factors together. Okay, so you won't be adding these or anything weird like that. You'll just be multiplying them together. Okay? So, here is the lowest order diagram that describes the decay of the neutral kaon. It's proportional to sine theta c, cosine theta c, and theta is 13.5. So that's, you know, that's, that's, this is fourth order, and this is bringing the value down. Okay. Here's the thing. K0 actually lives a lot longer than this predicts. All right? It lives a lot longer than this diagram being the main contribution predicts. Well, in 1970, Glashow, Iliopolis, and Miani, also known as GIM, and I'm not going to write down those names because writing down Iliopolis will take us till 615. Um, GIM proposed the following explanation for why the kaon lives much longer than this diagram predicts it does. Okay? They said They said, what if there was a diagram for the kaon? In addition to this diagram, there was a diagram for the kaon that looked like this. Sarah, you gotta get a good look at it. Uh, what am I missing on this? There is no up quark. Yeah, there's no up quark. Because if I put an up quark here, that's the exact same diagram as that. Okay? But this is what GIM proposed. They said, what if there existed another quark? Which they just so happen to call a charm quark. Moreover, what if the vertex factors for these things were instead of being multiplied by sine theta and cosine theta, or cosine, yeah, cosine theta and sine theta, were multiplied by minus sine theta and cosine theta. Well, what would the overall theta dependence of this matrix amplitude be? Don't make me draw a card. Come on, guys. Minus sine theta, cosine theta? Yeah, this one would be proportional to minus sine theta, cosine theta. What am I doing to these two m's to get the total m? Squaring them. Oh, well, adding them, sorry. I'm adding them, and then I'm squaring the result. Well, if I'm adding them, notice what might happen. They might cancel. Yeah, now they're not exactly going to cancel because the mass of the u is not the same as the mass of the c. Okay? But that's, that's okay because the k on does decay. If these exactly canceled, then you'd have to go to next order in order to get a decay rate, which would make it much, much smaller. But no, it, it actually happens at this fourth order, but only because the mass of the up quark and the mass of the charm quark are slightly different. Okay? But they're competing diagrams in terms of their contribution to M. So GIM, Clashow, Leopolis, and Maini, um, 
propose the existence of this charm quark, okay, in 1970. The charm quark was actually discovered in what is arguably the greatest year in the history of science and living in general. That's 1974. Amazing things happened in 1974 that I'm not even going to go over. I was born. Um, astonishing things happened in 1974. I was born. Uh, but anyway, so um, <laughs> it's funny. I don't know if I'm making you guys laugh or if you're just like, yeah, whatever, Florently, just get through this shit. <laughs> okay, anyway, all right. So, um, now I'm going to sort of summarize this story, and then we'll extend it. Uh, let me see. I'm going to erase this, and this, and this, and this. Okay, while you're erasing, I do have a question. Sure. So, how do we actually know that the leptons don't experience generation <coughs> mixing? Because the generation mixing of... Uh, like electrons to muon neutrinos? Is there any way we can actually distinguish muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos? Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so actually that's, that's, first of all, that's where a huge complication with neutrinos having mass enters the story. So I'm, I'm predicating my, dis my discussion on the assumption that neutrinos don't have mass, um, in which case this is confined per generation. And I'm about to explain to you in just a minute why um, it gets... Let, let me finish what I'm about to say, Gabriel, and it might help in your understanding, okay? So let me finish what I'm about to say, and if it's not clear after what I'm about to say, then raise your hand and ask a question again, okay? So, um, okay, so if you, if you weren't paying attention, then what we discovered was that basically you could write the down and the strange quark as combinations as linear combinations of the down and the strange with the associated factors cosine and sine. Okay? And then, If instead of working with up, down, charmed, strange, I work with up, down prime, charmed, strange prime, where down prime is this linear combination, strange is this linear combination, then what I discover is that the W interactions are now keeping me within these redefined generations. Okay? So remember that this Keeping inside of this generation actually gives me two diagrams, one with the down and one with the strange coming from the up. But if this is the linear combination, then the interaction is keeping me within this generation and then it's similarly keeping me within this generation. Okay? Now, it's just weird because you have up, down, charm strange as families, and you might ask yourself, why the fuck did I ever even label these? Why didn't I just start out with this D prime and S prime? Like, what is, what is the point of these? You know, why don't you just take this as your definition of the down quark and the strange quark, and then this is just a two-particle family, up and down prime, and charmed and strange prime. You know, what, what, is, what was the point of even introducing these ideas? Okay. Well, here's the thing. 
you have this here, but when you want to analyze the effects of the W interactions, you need to work with these superposition states. Now, if you think about it, you know, if, if, I, if I have a vector, you know, it's like, actually, let me just call this the, the up and the down axis. If I have a purely up vector, and then I transition to this new basis, the purely up vector in this basis becomes a linear combination of up prime and down prime in the transition basis. Now where in physics have you encountered that if you start out with a pure vector, pure state, in one basis, and something forces you to transition to a new basis, then that pure state becomes a superposition state in the new basis. Where in physics have you encountered this? And I'm not talking about math. I mean, clearly, you know, with x, y coordinates, mathematically, this all works out cleanly. But I'm talking about kind of states. Any guesses? Measurement. Measurement in what? Yes, so in what? Classical physics? No, quantum physics. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't hear you say quantum physics, but quantum physics is the context you want to be in. Yeah, in quantum, you know that if you're in a pure P state, So if in the, in the momentum basis, you're sitting along a, 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 an axis, and then you decide, nope, I want to use a position basis instead of a momentum basis for my states, this pure Px state is going to become a superposition of position states. Okay? Huh. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna rewrite the word state because that was horrible. Alright, does everybody remember this from quantum? A pure momentum state is a superposition of position states. Likewise, a pure position state is a superposition of momentum states. Okay? Now what is it? that we know about the operator defining the momentum basis and the operator defining the position basis, what is it we know about those operators that tells us, yeah, a pure state in one is a superposition in the other? What's the property of the operators? Commutator? Yeah, the commutator. The commutator of px and x is not zero. Those operators don't commute, okay? If they did, I mean, if you did px and py, the commutator is zero, and you can be in a pure px state and a pure, pure py state, okay? But px and x position don't commute, therefore you go from a pure state to a superposition state. Now, you might wonder what operator is associated with this, and what operator is associated with this, and I'm just going to give you the answer, because we're, we're not doing a, 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 um, a Hamiltonian formalism of our quantum you know, thing, but I just want to throw this out there. These are eigenstates of the Dirac Hamiltonian operator. That is, these are the eigenstates of freely propagating up-down charm and strange quarks. They're governed by the Dirac equation, which has an associated operator that is the Hamiltonian, the Dirac Hamiltonian. And if you just find the set of eigenstates of this operator, then the up, down, charm, strange in this format are pure states. Okay? However, these are eigenstates of the weak interaction vertex operator. These states are relevant when you're actually having an interaction. Okay? 
So when, you, when you're doing a diagram, you start out in Hamiltonian eigenstates, but then the weak interaction vertices force you into these states. And of course, as you can guess, these two operators do not commute. Which is why pure states here become superposition states under the weak interaction vertex. Okay? All right, now, let's see. So that's kind of cool. We can throw in a C, and we know that this should actually be D bar C bar if we're talking about the interactions. But it turns out the story gets a little extended. And after GIM, Glashow, Eliopis, and, Rim, Rim, and Mani, after they had proposed the existence of C in 1970, and before the C was observed in the most wonderful year in the history of mankind, which is 1974, zero is born, um, Kobayashi and Maskawa said, you know what? Why are you just going to add one particle there? Screw that. Let's fill out the third generation. Why not? So Kobayashi and Maskawa introduced... The new generation of quarks, and now I'm going to relabel this charmed, strange, top and bottom, because this is the more functionally useful thing because of the charge alignment. I'm just, I just did this because of the mass and the order in which they were discovered. Um, so they, they introduced the top and the bottom doublet, and moreover, they introduced mixing now between everything on the bottom and a state in the top. So now what we have for the interaction eigenstates as superpositions of the free direct Hamiltonian eigenstates is something like this. Okay. So what I had written up there earlier, which was just D prime S prime written down as superpositions of D and S, that was just this upper left two by two and it had cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. They expanded this to not only the existence of this extra generation, but also the mixing of all of the generations, okay? This guy is what is, of course, called the Kabibo for this 4x4, or 2x2, two two, plus Km for these extra terms, and this is what's called the CKM matrix. All right? Now, to, to, to roughly give you an idea of how you know, difficult some of this can be defined, um, this thing is approximately the identity with small corrections off on the off diagonal. Okay? Now, you might wonder, in reality, why the hell did Kobayashi and Moskawa introduce this? I mean, they were conjecturing the existence of two particles that had never been seen, they hadn't even seen the C yet, and then they go ahead and they introduce this interesting, you know, three by three matrix, which is mixing all of these generations together. What, where the hell did they get the impulse to do that? Any idea? 
Acid, yeah, probably acid. Um, that's acid spelt in the Flemish manner where it begins with the letter I, which is the same as imaginary. But I'm just making shit up. But, but imaginary is important because it turns out, and if you've read your homework assignment, you know, if you want to, so in the D prime, S prime case, All right, first of all, this, is, this can be a complex matrix, but if you just had the, the two by two version, this is before top and bottom are introduced, then in the two by two version, by redefining the phases of the quarks, you can take this complex two by two matrix and render it real. Kobayashi and Moscow are really, really wanted some inextricable imaginary part to the matrix. And they realized, from their mathematical background, that bumping it up to a three by three matrix would render it impossible by the redefinition of quark phases to completely remove all imaginary components. You'd have to have at least one imaginary component left in the matrix. A detail which is not at all obvious and would have been obvious if I had lectured last Thursday on the same thing I lectured two years ago the last time I taught this on my E-Days lecture which morphed from this topic into the monster group, but anyway, is that an imaginary quantity in the generational mixing matrix is essential for CP violation. Now, you don't know what CP violation is. That's something that I might or might not get to cover in this course. But it was something which was understood to be an essential part of the standard model, and in particular, an explanation of the baryon asymmetry of the universe. The baryon asymmetry of the universe being generated requires there to be some CP violating term. And their insight was that this model, with only the two by two matrix, where these quarks don't exist, there's no way this can give you CP violation. This can give you CP violation. So that's what they were actually after. So it led them to introduce two quarks and the mixing of everything. And in 1964, oh sorry, in 19, by 1995, all of these quarks had been discovered. Okay, so it took a while to actually, you know, discover experimentally the top and the bottom quarks. But by 1995, everything that had been predicted had been discovered. Now, when you're working with, you know, uh, this transition, it's actually not that bad. Because all you have to do is when you're drawing a diagram and you have a W come out, and this will be W minus, then what we can do is we can label the incoming quark as a high quark and the outgoing quark as the low quark. And what I mean by that is the upper components of each of the doublets is the high quark and the lower component is the low quark because the W always transitions you between the top and the bottom. It's just it might take you between this and this and this and this and this and this, okay? So when you're calculating the diagram, It depends on whether you're doing an up and a down, an up and a strange, or an up and a bottom, but the vertex factor is just minus IGW over two root two, gamma mu, one minus gamma five, times the Kobayashi Maskawa, the, the, the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix um, element from the high to the low. Okay, so you'll notice the labeling here. This is V up down, V up strange, V up bottom, V C D. These are just the, the coefficients and the linear combination of going from the Hamiltonian eigenstates to the interaction eigenstates. But when you're actually doing this in practice, if I draw a diagram and I make this an up quark and a down quark, then I write this as the vertex factor and then I just put in the value of V U D. That's all you have to do, okay? If you make this an up and a strange, then you use VUS, which is going to be much smaller than the VUD contribution. Okay? 
Sound pretty straightforward? It's okay. It's okay. All right. So, um, so this is the weak story of the W plus and minus. I have not touched the Z naught. Let's talk about the Z naught. So the Z boson is rather interesting and admittedly rather hard to imagine detecting for the following reason. Okay. First of all, the W plus and minus play a crucial role in the decay of particles because they change the flavor. They take you from the top to the bottom. That changes an up quark into a down quark. The Z boson is electrically neutral, so it can't change flavor. So the Z boson is not directly related to decays in the way that W plus and minus are. However, Z plays an interesting role because it turns out that any time you have a process which can be realized by an electromagnetic exchange of a photon, you can always take this process and add to it a diagram with the same in and out states, of course, because that's the only thing you should add, where we replace the photon with the Z-naught boson, okay? So M would contain contributions from both the photon exchange and the Z-naught boson exchange. Now, which of these contributions is going to be larger? Is Josh on? Yeah. Josh, yeah, Josh. Which of these contributions is going to be larger? Yeah, the electromagnetic is definitely way bigger, but why? I mean, is it the coupling G, G gamma compared to G weak? Isn't G gamma less than G weak? Um, yes. Yes, so why is this diagram more important than this one? Any takers? Avery, you got me, bro? <laughs> I got it. It's because the Xenon boson is mass. Exactly. Remember, the Xenon boson is mass. It's not just massive. It's fucking huge. It's got a huge mass compared to this, which is massless. Remember I said that the propagators... We'll have a denominator, which is q squared minus m squared c squared. Well, this has just got q squared. This has got q squared minus big fucking m squared c squared. Okay? So that makes the contribution from this diagram much smaller. All right? So you can imagine that even though this process can contribute, it's always going to be completely engulfed by this. So, you know, to within your experimental accuracy, it's going to be hard to figure out whether this is actually creating a contribution or not. However, is this process invertible? That is, I said for any diagram with a photon, you can replace the photon with a Z naught boson. Can I also say that for any diagram with a Z naught boson, you can replace it with a photon? Gabriel, it's wonderful to see the top of your head responding. Ross has given me the thumbs down. I'm getting the thumbs up. I'm kind of confused by your responses, but this silence is just weird. Anyway, the answer is no. There are diagrams which contain a Z-naught which you cannot replace with a photon. Here's a simple one.
Remember, the weak interactions affect every single particle. They don't care whether you're electrically charged or not. They affect every single particle, including neutrinos. Neutrinos don't carry electric charge. So a photon cannot be connected to a neutrino vertex. Okay? However, the Z-naught boson can be. So all you have to do is have an experiment where you detect neutrino scattering off of charged particles, and you'll find out, you know, the details about the Z-naught boson. How easy do you think that experiment is? It's ridiculously hard. <laughs> the neutrinos barely interact at all. Okay, I mean, hopefully you've, you've, you've read a little bit or heard a little bit about the neutrino experiments, but they're just notoriously crazy. Um, okay, so... By the way, this was actually detected in 1973, okay, at CERN. Um, and, you know, looking at it, it you know, it, it looks kind of simple because you're not doing um, a, an up to down kind of transition like we do with the W plus and minus. So there's no flavor changing. So therefore, we don't have to worry about, you know, linear combinations of the lower, you know, states connected to a single higher state. So it seems like the Z-naught diagrams are probably going to be very similar to the gamma diagrams the electromagnetic interaction, right? No, it's not, okay? Let me show you the problem. So, um, for W plus and minus, the vertex factor that you enter has the following form, and I've already written this once, minus I G W two root two, gamma mu, 1 minus gamma 5, times either the cosine theta c, the sine theta c, plus or minus on the sine theta. Okay? But basically it's this overall, you know, Kobayashi, Kobibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix contribution times this thing, and this thing is the same in every diagram, or every interaction vertex. Okay? That's if it involves the emission or absorption of a W plus or minus. Okay? For Z0, it's not so simple. Z0 takes the following form. Minus IGZ over 2 root 2 times gamma mu times CFV minus CFA gamma 5. Okay? Now, don't, don't be scared. These are just numbers. But compared to this, here the number is 1, and here the number is 1. You're multiplying gamma 5 by 1 in this expression. Okay? but they're not one for the Z-naught exchange. Now let me explain what these various things mean. First of all, F stands for the family, and the family is either the top row or the bottom row of leptons or quarks, because the Z-naught can interact with both of them. And so the family, and this is just telling you what family you're dealing with, so the families come either in the uh, top, so the neutri neutrinos, the bottom of the leptons, the electron, the muon, and the tau on, the top row of quarks, or the bottom row of quarks, okay? And then once you've picked your F, then you have the CV factor, where if you pick the first family, then this is one half. If you pick the second family, it's a way more understandable, 0 0.0806.
If you pick the third family, then it's a more manageable 0.2204. And if you pick the fourth family, it's minus 0.3602. Okay, so there, you know, one half, nice number, and these are really nice numbers as well. Not, okay. Now the CA factors actually are pretty simple. They just alternate from one half to minus one half. Okay. Now let me let me let me be clear what I'm saying. If I wanted a, a, a you know to talk about an a interaction vertex with elements in this family, then I might be considering this. Okay, so what I'm saying is what I need to put for the vertex factor for this diagram, it's in this first family. So I write this expression. For CV, I put one half, and for CA, I put one half. That's all this means. It's not that hard. Okay, it's just fugly because of those stupid ass numbers. Okay? Why are those numbers there? Well, it turns out that even though these numbers take weird values, those values actually have an interpretation. First of all, one half is delicately interpreted as the number one half. It's deep shit, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, turns out this number can be interpreted as follows. Minus one half plus two times the sine squared of an angle. This guy is one half minus four thirds the sine squared of the angle. And this guy is minus one half plus two thirds times the sine of the angle. So in reality, even though these numbers look radically different, there's only one parameter that's truly controlling their very you know, distinct values, and it's this angle, which we call theta w, which is the Weinberg angle. And it takes a value of 28.75 degrees. Okay? So yeah, there are these really different numbers that you have to put in depending on what family you're dealing with, but at least it can kind of be interpreted in terms of this angle. But that angle actually plays a much more important role. I want you to remember for a moment that we are describing the weak interactions in terms of a spontaneously broken theory, right? The weak interactions come from taking SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge and then spontaneously breaking it to U1 of electromagnetism. Okay? Now, the way that we actually deal with this is we kind of think of this as an SU2, but this is broken, although it's not directly descended from this being broken and this surviving. Remember, these get mixed up. But at any rate, here, this is a single group with one coupling. Okay, even though it's got these two different factors. So at the end of the day, when we talk about the W coupling and the Z coupling, and they have different values, they, they literally have different numerical values, the one thing you have to remember is that they both come from this unification group, which only has one coupling. 
So you should expect there to be a relationship between the W plus minus and the Z couplings. And it turns out that that relationship is expressed in terms of the sine and the cosine of the Weinberg angle. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write down the relationships between these W and Z bosons and the electric coupling. Because remember, part of what gets broken is electro electromagnetism. So in this unified theory, all of the bosons, all four bosons, which include linear combinations of the W plus and minus, the Z naught and the photon, they all have the same coupling. And then when it gets broken, you have different values, but at least they're related to each other. Okay, so this sign, this theta, this Weinberg angle is playing an essential role. It's sort of a central figure in exactly how the spontaneous symmetry breaking occurred. And then last but not least, the mass of the Z and the W bosons are not the same, but they both came from massless bosons in the unified version of the theory. So in the broken you should expect a relationship between the masses, and it turns out to again depend on the Weinberg angle. Okay? So what I'm getting at in this, in this discussion here is just pointing out that, you know, the weak interactions, they look ugly, compared to the QCD and the electromagnetic interactions because of all these weird factors and mixing and all that crap, okay? But one of the key things to remember is that the weak interactions are not based on a current invariant Lagrangian under a, a weak interaction transformation. You remember the weak interaction bosons have mass, so you don't have gauge invariance under the transformation. And so working in the, in the spontaneously broken symmetry phase, the weak interaction material is just more complicated. However, if you could raise the energy and do all your experiments at the energy where everything is unified, then a lot of this mess goes away. Okay? All right, so that is it for today. I know it was painful. I know it was ugly. But next time we meet, I'm going, to re, I'm going to summarize all this again and compare the Feynman rules for the weak interactions with just the results of this, with the QCD, with the QED, and then we're going to do some calculations using the weak interactions as part of our Feynman diagrams, and we're going to calculate some decay rates and do some predictions of lifetime and show you how certain physical parameter sizes were gauged by starting out with the answer, which was having a measurement of the lifetime of something, doing a calculation which is supposed to predict that, keeping an unknown in the calculation, and then using the experimentally verified quantity to go back and figure out that unknown quantity. Okay, so we'll sort of get an idea of what it's like to do experiment next time. Any questions? Yeah, I just have one question about the final. The final exam, yes. Um, are we going to, uh, is it going to be cumulative for like all the material over the course or is it just going to be in the second half? Yeah, so that, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question, Ross. So the final is going to be cumulative. I'm going to email you the final. I was, I was going to give you the final. I'm going to give you the final in person by hand. I'm going to come to each of your houses in a, in, no, I'm just kidding. I will email you the final next Tuesday after our last class, and it will be due the following, not the immediately following Thursday, but the Thursday after that, which is the day of your exam. So you're gonna have a week and two days to work on the final, okay? And I'll set up some help sessions during that time frame when you can come and get help. The only thing I require about the final is that you don't work together unless you're in a Zoom meeting with me, where I can kind of, you know, watch how much you're, because I don't, you know, I don't want people to get together and just copy each other's answers, but you're welcome to work together. I just, you know, I want it, that to happen under my supervision. Okay, but it will be a cumulative final. It won't be, it won't be, 
It'll be a little hard, not too hard. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so my question still holds. Oh, sorry, yeah, oh shit. You were supposed to bring that up way earlier. Yeah, Gabriel. but I didn't know when, you were, when your uh, explanation was gonna be like fully completed. Sorry, yeah, so, go ahead and ask me again. <laughs> so, I still don't understand why, how we can say that um, mixing doesn't occur in the lepton states because if we are outputting um, a, a superposition of like neutrino states, then how the hell do we tell we're in a superposition of neutrino states? Because there's no way we're actually going to be out there measuring the neutrinos. Um, It, um, so I'll say this. Okay. The, so the argument is that if the neutrinos are massless, then you don't have mixing between generations. If they have mass, then there could very well be mixing between generations. Now the question is, why is it if they're massless, there's no mixing between generations? And the answer to that is simply, um, ouch. How do you know which of these neutrinos you're dealing with? You can't, you can't separate them by their electric charge. You can't separate them by their mass if they're all massless. So you might as well take your neutrinos and just pair them up with a particle and say, this is the interaction pairing. That's very different than when we're doing quarks. Because if I'm mixing U with D, S, B, and, and I have different diagrams contributing, those are different diagrams because D, S, B have different masses. Right? I mean, I have to use the linear combination of D, S, B, but each co contribution to the linear combination, they have different coefficients, but each contribution gives you a different diagram because they have different masses. Here, though, if all the neutrinos have the same mass, I can literally take the linear combination and call it the, the unique partner to the electron and the unique partner to the muon. And, and you see what I'm saying? So you just you don't have a way to distinguish these, so you just say, okay, screw it. I'll just have one that pairs with the electron, one that pairs with the muon, and yeah, I don't have any characteristics that would help me dissociate them. Okay. However, if they have mass, then you have the ability to differentiate between the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, the tauon neutrino, and then a linear combination might be non-trivial. Okay. And we do know they have mass, so mixing might occur. It's just that we don't have any way of knowing because we don't know what the mass is at all. Right. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? All right. I'm going to sign off. Uh, don't forget, you've got a homework due on Thursday. I will be holding office hours Wednesday from 5 to 8. Uh, last time, Avery showed up for three minutes. I appreciate that, Avery. I sat on my ass for three hours. But anyway, okay. All right, I'll see you guys.